tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee Hello, Water Street Church. My name is Jeremy Rambo. And I'm Amanda Rambo. And we're so glad you have joined us today. If this is your first time joining us, we'd like to spend a special welcome to you. We look forward to worshiping with you as a community in our living rooms, kitchens, and tables. For where two or three are gathered in God's name, he is there with us. We'd like to start off with some announcements to highlight some of the ones from the newsletter. First, we'll be hosting Alpha again. We're looking for volunteers to help make that happen. Please see the newsletter for contact information. There are a few other volunteer opportunities in there as well, including vacant church council positions, a refugee sponsorship committee, and sharing your stories of faith. A reminder that while the church and the office remain closed until further notice, there are still services available to you if you have need. There's lots more information in the newsletter. We encourage you to read that. As many of you know, one of the things that we have enjoyed is traveling. Many experiences we've had involve hiking mountains and experiencing the beauty, seeing things from high viewpoints, often after putting in a lot of effort to get to that place. Mountaintop experiences. It's a phrase used to describe some of those ultimate highs in life. Each of you can probably list some of your own, whether it was climbing a physical mountain or another accomplishment. Two passages from scripture come to mind. First, when Moses encounters God on Mount Sinai, and then when the disciples view Jesus' transfiguration on a mountaintop. Both the experiences of Moses and of the disciples offer glimpses of the awesome power and mystery of God's presence. Yet the reality of mountaintop experiences is that we don't live there. At some point, we have to come down. So how do we sustain a mountaintop experience of God in everyday life? How do we find God's presence each and every day? The psalmist suggests continual worship and praise, and Paul encourages us to live and serve with faithfulness and integrity. Our ability to find God's presence each and every day comes from God through worship and service. We are called into worship with these words from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. The Lord reigns. Let them praise God's holy name. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples rejoice in awe and wonder. The Lord reigns. Let them shout an exclamation. Let us come together in prayer. Radiant Lord, you shine with purity, power, and truth. Your mercy reflects your compassion, your care, and your love. Transform us into your image as we seek to follow you. Use us to make your presence known throughout the world. In your strong name we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends in Jesus Christ. We come into this place, you from your homes, me here in the sanctuary, to worship our God, to celebrate his forever faithfulness, 
We come knowing that it is his invitation that calls us, that woos us. And so receive now his greeting. Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his spirit be with you all. We now join together in song, and again a song celebrating the forever faithfulness, the forever goodness of our God. Let's sing together, you from your homes, uh, the song forever. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With the mighty hand and outstretched on, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. enter into this time of confession, we have been reminded that God calls us into his very presence, that God reveals his character, that God reveals his attributes, his kindness and his good to us, goodness to us as we enter into his presence. And so let us join now our, our hearts in a time of prayer in this time of confession. Lord, you call us to draw near, and yet we fail to hear. Perhaps it's because we are distracted. Perhaps it is our busyness, or perhaps it is because we are tired that we fail to hear your voice. And because of that, we ignore the needs of people around us. We worry about our own desires. And so forgive us. Forgive us when we shut out the call to climb into your presence, when we make excuses to put off that journey. Have mercy on us, O Lord, as we silently open our hearts and confess our sins now in this period of silence. Hear our cry. Hear our plea. Hear our longings, O God, and lift us to the newness of life, for we pray in Jesus' most powerful name. Amen. Hear now the words of assurance. We worship a forgiving God, whose mercy is never-ending, whose heart abounds with steadfast love, 
It is because of the love of Jesus Christ that we know that our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Indeed, friends in Jesus, this is good news. As we go make our way through life, It is in the face of a stranger and the greeting of a friend that we see our Lord. In the love of Christ, we worship as the community of God's people, a people we love because God first loved us and he loves them too. Amen. Many of you will remember the jars of applesauce that appeared at church every year since 2016. In all of these sales, the goal from proceeds was to help support World Renew in Cambodia. 
Our church is such a great supporter of World Renew, and so you are able to so richly support the team of Kathleen Lauder, Sylvan Nath, and others on the ground in Cambodia. Each year, a core group gathered in either the church kitchen or someone's home. One year, Mary Blydorp and Lynn Marfisi even went to pick free apples at a farm with an old orchard. We were so excited to see a bumper crop, which we then were able to pick over. In 2019, after looking at the World Renew Christmas Season catalog, we noticed something exciting. There was a request for a mobile library in Cambodia. But could we raise enough funds to buy one? The cost was over $400. We started communicating this dream through the church's newsletter. And by the time we had made and collected donations for our applesauce that year, guess what? We raised enough money for two libraries. Fast forward to this past Christmas. We received an update from Sylvan, the World Renew Country Consultant. He sent us pictures of the actual mobile library and the children enjoying it. Thankfully, the books can be covered because otherwise they would be covered in red, silty soil and wouldn't be usable. Sylvan shared that he used the prototype of other similar delivery carts which go behind an often ancient motorcycle. They have found that it is quite heavy and so that only one man in their contact group is able to operate this safely. As you can see, it is worth all of the labor to come to these villages. Look at all of the children who came to get a book. In the school that I visited, the library was very poorly stocked and the kids couldn't bring books home. Can you imagine just how life-changing it could be for a child to bring their own book home and share them with their families? What an amazing way to share the love of Jesus. Isn't it amazing to pause and reflect that on the other side of the world, Water Street Church was able to so tangibly help Cambodian kids and families. And all during the COVID lockdown. Praise God. Hi everyone. Today we're going to learn about some verses from the book of Exodus. And Exodus is the second book of the Bible uh, near the beginning of the Old Testament. And it's called Exodus because it's the story of Moses and the Israelites exiting Egypt. And they're heading to the promised land and God is leading them there. So this particular verse we're looking at and that you'll hear about in the sermon is words of God that God said to Moses telling Moses more about him. And he said this to Moses right after he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. So I'm not going to read you this story because this is a story of the first time Moses got the Ten Commandments. And this conversation actually happens after the second time Moses is given the Ten Commandments. Because the Israelites kind of mess up, mess up after the first time. Anyways, God is explaining to Moses a little more about who he is. And some of the things, some of the words he uses to describe himself are compassionate, which means caring abounding in love which means overflowing in love slow to anger which means god is really patient and very forgiving so god tells us all those things about himself but he also says in the next sentence i do not leave the guilty unpunished and a lot of people struggle with this maybe little people and big people too they think well how can god be super loving and just totally love us and also be a little bit like a judge where if you do something wrong, there's a sentence or a punishment that you have to serve because of that. And how do those two things kind of go together? Well, when Jesus came later on in the New Testament, Jesus calls God our Father. In fact, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're supposed to start it with our Father. So Jesus was trying to explain that God is like a father. If you think of your parents, I bet your parents have rules. And these rules have lots of purposes. Some of the rules teach you to be respectful and kind. Some of their rules teach you to be responsible and helpful. And some of their rules just keep you safe. So your parents expect you to follow all their rules. And if you don't follow their rules, there will be some consequences. But your parents never stop loving you. And the whole reason there's consequences if you break the rules is because they want you to learn and they want you to grow. And if they just said, oh, well, whenever you broke a rule, you'd never learn, right? So God is like that. In fact, 
if you think of your parents, you might have had a timeout when you were little if you did something wrong. Well, God gave the Israelites a timeout. They didn't get to go to the promised land, not the first generation. In fact, they had a 40 year timeout while well, they figured out how they were supposed to behave. And then their children got to go to the promised land instead. But God loved them the whole time through all those 40 years and for thousands of years beyond and before. And God was always with them and leading them and guiding them and helping them along even when they were making mistakes over and over again. So I hope this verse has helped you learn a little bit more about what God's love is like. So we're going to pray together before we go. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for having rules for us too. Rules to teach us how we should act, how we should behave, um, rules to keep us safe, rules to guide us through our lives so we can be good followers and ambassadors of you. Thank you so much for loving us and being our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in congregational prayer. Gracious and almighty God, creator of the universe, wonderful savior in Jesus Christ, we gather to worship you. Dear heavenly majesty, our anchor in this drifting world, our hope for the future, we love you, we adore you, Thank you for truth and grace in Jesus Christ. Thank you for Canada, our home and native land. Thank you for our national health care system. Enable it, we pray, to overcome this COVID pandemic. Thank you for our government stability in the midst of this world of rapid changes. Thank you for the food grown in the past summer that we may eat this winter. Thank you for life eternal, our hope, and your gift in Jesus Christ. We pray for our shut-in people, the aged, ill, lonely, and troubled. Embrace them in your arms, and specifically rename Gary, Jane, Helen, Mark, Mike, and Faye, please hold them close to your breast and let them know that feeling, that trust, that hope in you. We pray for our schools, our teachers and pupils, as they are challenged for lack of personal contact and human warmth. Bless our teachers with energy and wisdom to lead students well and gain fulfillment in their work. Bless our parents, we pray, 
with their children at home from school. We pray for our world. Where there is war, please bring peace. Where there is starvation, please bring food. Enable us to live in harmony and peace across the globe. Bless our missionaries, we pray, in sharing your love to people adrift in despair across the world. We pray for our church, our denomination. Enable us as members to understand our neighbors, to respect and honor each other as your creatures. Bless our pastor as he leads us in your word of grace and truth. Please open our member minds and hearts to your word of life. We pray your blessing on our leaders in our congregation, that they may have your wisdom and spirit to bless them in their decisions. Grant, O oh dear God, your love as we celebrate again your wonderful way of life at home in this COVID situation. Thank you, dear God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us listen to the word of God found in Exodus chapter 34. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the father to the third and to the fourth generation. And we will end the reading of God's word there. I will add to that reading the last verse. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshipped. Over these last number of weeks, we have been exploring the nature and the character of God, His attributes, if you will. And we do that because there's a lot of confusion around this word, God. There a, are a lot of caricaturizations around this word, God. And so we have come to this book of the Bible, this book of Exodus, where Elohim God, that's his title, introduces himself through his personal name, Yahweh, where God reveals to Moses and to the people of Israel his character, his attributes. And today we come to a section of scripture, a section of scripture like no other, a section of scripture where the attributes of God are Listed, There is no other scripture or passage of the Bible that lists the character traits of God so systematically, so thoroughly than this passage of scripture that we've just read. He is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children to their children or and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generations. And, and we hear those words and, and we love verse 6, don't we? 
He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, maintaining love to a thousand generations, 7a. And then we come to that judgment part. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. And we we hear those two verses and, and they seem to be in tension with each other. They seem to be contradictory with each other. How do we hold these two character traits, these attributes of God that he reveals about himself, how do we hold them in the oneness of God that we believe? Let me give you, and we're going to answer that over the course of this sermon, but let me give you a a quick lesson in biblical literacy. It seems as if the author is is listing a bunch of character traits, a a bunch of attributes of God, one after the other, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, maintaining love, but he will also be that judge. He lists them one after the other, but we need to know that that we, in, as we enter into the, these questions about the character of God, that we are not engaging in the kind of speculation that many philosophers engage in. The kind of speculation that, that lead them to phrases about God, that he is the unmoved mover, that he is the uncaused cause, these phrases that, that leave us scratching our heads, that leave us holding our glasses and pursing our, our lips and rubbing our chins. We are not engaging in that kind of speculation. And when the scriptures lists the attributes of God, they do so most often in two different forms. They do so most often through the form of story and through the for- form of poetry. And we have both of these in this passage as well as the preceding passages of Scripture. In order for us to understand this list of God's attributes, we need to know the story. And we told part of that story last week when we looked at Exodus chapter 33. That story includes Exodus chapter 32, That story of the people of Israel who had been rescued from the land of Egypt by the hand of God, by the mighty hand of God, that people who had been brought through the wilderness to the foot of a mountain, that mountain that has two names, Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, it is in that place that God gives to Moses and now to the people of Israel his law. That that law that says the very first law, the very first command that says, you shall have no other gods before me. That second command that says, you shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below. Yahweh appears to the people of Israel in that cloud, in that thunderstorm that that settles on top of that mountain. He gives to them his ways. He shows them how he wants them to live as his people. But what is the first thing that the people of Israel do? We rehearsed that story last week. They go to Aaron and they ask Aaron to form for them a calf. They give to him some of the gold earrings that they had taken from the people of Egypt. And he fashions for them an idol. An idol in the form of a calf. And then we are told that as, uh, as that calf emerges, that the people of Israel begin to revel, they begin to eat and drink, they have a party and they get hammered. And then we are told that they engage, and here is a rather euphemistic phrase, they began to engage in revelry. And that word you used there is this word that has undertones of, they engaged in sexual practices, And the question becomes, where did they they learn that, that this was an appropriate way to worship God? And of course, as the story is told, we know that the people of Israel 
learned worship practices in Egypt. They learned the work, worship practices of the Egyptians with whom they lived. They learned worship practices of the Canaanite uh, uh, nations that surrounded Egypt. And they are just uh, following in the footsteps of their own parents, their own fathers and mothers in engaging in this kind of worship. We are told that when God looks at the people of Israel engaging in these practices, he's furious. He wants to wipe them out and, and Moses talks God out of it. And then Moses comes before God, pleading, says, you have told me that I have found favor with you. You've asked me to lead these people. And then he says, I want to know you by name. For I have found favor with you, and if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. And then God launches into this lengthy description of his character. I am Yahweh, Lord, Lord. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. I am the one who shows mercy and love. I maintain my love. For a thousand generations, I am the one who also is the just judge. I am the one who will judge the sins to the third and the fourth generation. As we hear those words, there's a lot of confusion around these attributes, and, and we're going to make our way through each one individually, make our way through this pas passage of Scripture. We come across that first phrase, I am compassionate and I am gracious. Those two words are used 13 times to describe God's attributes in the Old Testament, and most often those two words come together. They are used in conjunction with each other. They are never separated from each other, and that's important for us to know. He is compassionate, and he is gracious. Compassion is a feeling word, but grace is an action word. And in order for us to understand why these two things, these two attributes of God need to come together, let me tell two stories, two short stories as an illustration. Maybe you've watched the movie Hotel Rwanda. In that movie, it portrays the, the brutal brutal killing of the Tutsis by the Hutus. It portrays how a, a, a group of military men and women that uh, uh, joined together under the banner of the United Nations, led by Romeo or General Romeo Dallaire, went to Rwanda to stop this genocide. When they got there, they saw the brutality of what was happening and, and one person says to Romeo Dallaire, we need to film this, we need to get this out. To which Romeo Dallaire says, why? People will just see the images, they'll go tisk, 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 that's too bad. And they'll go back to their dinner plates. Compassion without action is mere sentimentality. And yet we are told that, that God has compassion and grace on his people. That word compassion is a, is a maternal word. It, it carries with it this notion of, of what happens in the womb of a woman. In fact, in the Hebrew language, to be compassionate and that word womb are interchangeable. I don't know very much about maternal instinct, but I do know about paternal instinct. And, and here's my second illustration. I remember uh, our, our first children, our first child when she was born. I, I remember feeling this, this move of love, this depth of love that I had never felt before, except for my wife, of course. I remember also wondering to myself how I would, would act as a father, especially around one of my particular weaknesses. And, and one of my weaknesses is I have a very, very weak stomach, a gag reflex like no other. I, I wonder what, wondered what would happen when it came time to that first change of diaper. I wondered what would happen when it came time to, to clean up some of the messes that our children make, and, and all of our children make messes. 
And I remember one time my daughter being sick. She was crying and weeping, and in her illness, she threw up all over the bathroom. And, and that's one of those moments where my stomach begins to churn. But, but I remember this distinctly. I remember looking at the weeping of my daughter. I remember her feeling so horrible. I remember my heart going out to her. And, and all I wanted to do at that moment in time is I wanted to hold her and I wanted to clean her up. Even though I have this, this weakness, that's grace. And I felt none of those things that I thought I might feel. When God describes himself as the compassionate, gracious one, he's not only describing his feelings towards his people, longing for them to be rescued from the land of slavery, longing for them to be relieved from all of the terrible things that had happened to them there. He does something about it. He rescues them in an act of gracious compassion. He goes near to them. He pulls them out of that land of slavery. He does for them what they could not do for themselves. He does not give to them what they deserve, but he rescues them. That's grace. That's grace. God is the compassionate and he is the gracious one. The next listed attribute in this passage of Scripture is another funny one. He is listed as the one who is slow to anger. And again, he, he describes how he's slow to anger in that, in that story that he has just told. That story where indeed his anger flares up. This, this word slow to anger means long of nose. And immediately my mind turns to Pinocchio. Is that what we're talking about here? That God is a liar? No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's this idea of of what happens in our anger. Our nose begins to flare. God, God, when it comes to his anger, is slow to anger. His nose uh, flares not very easily. He's abundant in love. And again, as we look at various passages of Scripture, in the NIV, the word uh, word there is the word hesed. And that word loved or translated into love is, is not very helpful, especially in the English language. We use that word love when we talk about how we love pizza, how we might love a particular movie. I love Shawshank Redemption. Or we use that word when we talk about the most important relationships in our lives. I can say, I love my wife. And of course, I mean very different things when I talk in that way. But the Hebrew language is very specific. When it uses the word hesed, other passages or other translations have added a word. It's the word covenant love. In our culture, When we use the word love, we are most often describing a feeling, a feeling that we have towards the object of our love. But theologians use another word when describing God's love. It's that word hesed. It's the word that describes more than just a feeling. It describes an action. Back to that, that, that what I described when God is described as both compassionate as well as merciful. The best analogy for us to understand this word hesed love is is in the analogy of or in the metaphor of marriage. Do you know that the easiest day to say I love you is on that wedding day? And if you've been married, if you've been married especially for any length of time, do you always like or always love the person that you are married to or that you married on your wedding day? Not a chance. There are some days that you darn right dislike them. God's love, though, God's loving us, doesn't mean that he's happy with us all the time. This is, or that's the profound thing of what's what's going on here. That God has eternally bound himself permanently in a covenant relationship with his people, with a people that he knows will rebel against him a people that he knows will turn their backs on him. 
And, and he knows what this covenant of life or, or love will, will demand of him. It will demand of him forgiveness. It will demand of him the kind of, of, of covenant love that says, I am going to stay, I am going to be faithful to this relationship, even when the object of my love, that is my people, even when they rebel. And here's how Paul puts it in one of the most glorious passages of Scripture. He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us redeemed us, brought us to himself. God is slow in anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. And then we, we come to this section of scripture, this section of scripture that we find in verse seven, maintaining love to a thousand or to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. We, we like that, yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. As we look at that particular section, I want to do kind of a deep dive into this particular section of Scripture, for this is, is poetry. It, it uses language that, that communicates beyond just the words or the literal interpretation of those words. I land on two phrases. They're at the beginning and at the end of this verse, maintaining love to thousands, and the last word, words are, and he, and he punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. In fact, when we look at the Hebrew, it doesn't have the word generation. That word is inserted there. It's implied. All it says, it, is, it says is, it, or is it that God punishes to the threes and to the fours. Now here's what we need to know. Here's what we need to, to, to read in this passage of scripture. He maintains love to, to thousands, but punishes to the threes and to the fours. And again, as we look at this and, and realize that this is poetry, what God is communicating that is, is, is this, is that his love is eternal. That his love is maintained to the thousands. That his love never ends. But he punishes to the, th the threes and the fours. He maintains his love forever. And so as we, as we think about that, when it comes to how God uh, reveals himself to the people of Israel and to us throughout Scripture, we realize that God maintains his hesed love to, for, forever by being both gracious and compassionate, but as, as well as by punishing. And again, these two things are, are not mutually exclusive. These are not two, not, not two attributes that God reveals, uh, at, or, or one attribute that God reveals at one time and another attribu attribute that he reveals at another time. These are two attributes held within the same God. We are told that God forgives wickedness and rebellion and sin and the Hebrew word there is the word nasah. It means to carry. It means to pick up. It means to, to hold that word nasah, that word that we translate to forgive. This word that carries with it this idea that, that if we are made in the image of God, made for communion with God, made to live in, in love for our neighbor because they too have been made in the image of God, when we sin, when we rebel, and in our wickedness we turn away from God and when we turn away from our neighbor, God will have to, in order to maintain that relationship forever, God will have to do a lot of carrying. He will have to do a lot of carrying of our sin. Those sins that fracture relationships, that bring about shame and injustice, those, those, those sins through which we snub other people, those sins that spread and spread and spread like a rock thrown into a pool. 
then begin to bounce off the edges of that pool that spread their deadly work into a world. If God is going to maintain his love forever, he will have to show gracious compassion. He will have to forgive. And that's Yahweh's offer. That, that we, if we come to him, if we are open, in, uh, o- open to God carrying our sin, if we are open to God's, uh, God's shaping our character, God is ready. He's ready. He's right there to forgive. But in this story that I've been referencing from our Exodus chapter uh, 32, there are 3,000 of the people of Israel who are put to death. They are put to death because of not only their rebellion, but their, uh, uh, their continued rebellion, their continued turning their face away from God, their continued move away from God. And here we come to that last section, that last movement in this passage of Scripture, where we read these words, he punishes to the, the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation, that's how we read it in the NIV, NIV. but it's, uh, we read it in the Hebrew. He punishes the uh, sins of the children for the sins of the father to the threes and to the fours. And we ask ourselves, well, well what is the author of the book of Exodus trying to tell us? Is the author of the book of Exodus trying to tell us that, that we will be punished for the sins of our grandparents? And, and the answer to that question is no, a definitive no. I can say a definitive no because the Bible says a definitive no. We read about that in places like Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 and Deuter- Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16. I'll just read one. You can look the other one up on your own. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, we read these words, The soul of whose sins shall die, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer the iniquity of the sons. In other words, I will not be punished for the sins of my grandfather, nor will my grandchildren be punished for my sins. That's not what the Bible is trying to say. What the Bible is trying to say, and again, this, uh, the message is repeated in the story of, from Exodus chapter 32. The story is that the people of Israel are actually repeating the sins of their grandparents. They are worshiping in a way that, that God does not want. They are rebelling. They themselves have turned their backs on God. And it reminds us again It reminds us again that indeed God's patience is good. That God's gracious compassion is good. But God's judgment is there. That he wants his people to live in communion with him. That he wants his people to to then turn towards their neighbor in love. That God wants his people, as we read about in the New Testament, to be changed into the very image of their Savior. That is the good news of the gospel. That God will never leave us. That his hesed love is always there for us to receive when, if we turn to, to God in repentance. That God's grace and his compassion, it's always there if we, again, repent from our sins. But if we turn our back on God, if we continually turn our back on God, indeed, God is a righteous judge. God is that righteous judge who will continually woo. God is that righteous judge who will continually call his children back to him. Thanks be to God that we have such a gracious and compassionate God who, as we sang about earlier in our service, whose love is forever, whose faithfulness is forever, who will never leave us or forsake us, who will walk with us in our times of need. Thanks be to God. Let's now sing our hymn of response, the blessing. Let's uh, come to God in this time of worship, in this time of reflection. Amen.
children and their children may the 